Uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, so my name is David Higgins, and this is uh, Robert Schwarz. We're going to give you the tutorial on Julia, the new numerical computing language. Uh, we're slightly surprised to see so many people in the room this early, especially given how the weather has been the last 24 hours in Berlin. Um, before it disappears from the screen, we have the GitHub repository uh, address here. If you clone that to your computer, you'll have access to both the notebooks that we're using and to HTML versions of them. So if anyone's really struggling to get Julia working on their machine, you can just follow on the HTML file. So co uh, copy that quickly or get it off one of your neighbors. I think many people have already cloned it. Uh, for that matter, if anyone hasn't realized, your Wi-Fi password is on the back of your uh, ID here. So you can connect to the network um, and you can download everything. We're going to try and do this in an interactive manner. And we, um, we posted it as an intermediate tutorial. Also, it's the Pi Data Conference. So we expect that most of you have a, some decent level of programming experience. But you probably have zero experience of Julia. So in a sense, we're going to try and do the A to Z while keeping people interested also with more advanced topics. Um, so let's just test, what is the size like for people here? Do I need to zoom this more? Can I put, it, put up your hands if you, really, if you really need me to do an extra zoom on the, on the font here? <laughs> One person who's standing, then, then come up the front. <laughs> uh, we, we have two or three seats still here along the side, if you guys, if it's literally only you guys. I'd like to keep as much, obviously, a screen space available as possible, so I don't want to over zoom either. So how, how many people have a real problem here and I need to actually increase the zoom? Nobody now, because I've bullied you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so Julia, uh, what is it? It's a scripted programming language. So since we're, we're assuming you have some kind of Python knowledge and you're data scientist, something like that. Uh, the big selling points of it are that it's easy to write, like Python, you would say. Uh, it's fast, and it's been designed from the ground up for numerical processing. And so Python was not des de designed around numerics. You need to use all of your libraries. You need to use um, NumPy and so on in order to do numerics properly in Python. Julia has been designed by some people who previously worked on optimizing supercomputer work and for numerical processing, and they decided to design a new language. And they decided to design it in a way that you write it once and you can run it anywhere. So I, I hate the phrase they use, but they call it the two-language two problem. So you, you can write it in this language as a simple script. And as you need more and more uh, speed gains, you can modify your script and you can put in extra details and you can get more speed out of your system. The other thing that they uh, concentrated on was parallelization. We're going to do a bit of that at the end, but we're actually going to do fairly advanced parallelization using OpenCL. Um, the inbuilt parallelization is not stable yet. So it's, it's coming. It's more or less there at this point, but the new release of Julia only came out last week. So that's probably the version you're using, and it's the version we're using for the tutorial, but we're far from experts in it at this point. OK, so the outline of the, the workshop I'm going to give the introduction section, so just how to get up and running with Julia, but only two or three words. I mean, you, you need to figure out how to install it yourself effectively. A, an overview of the basics of the language. So if we just dive in and see how we play with it from a numerical point of view, from a programming point of view, how do we use it? How would you compare it with Python and MATLAB and C, depending on your background? I don't have such a, a strong background in R, so you're going to have to bridge that gap yourself. Um, and what is it about Julia that's different? What is, it, what, are, what is the key component that makes it Julia as opposed to a different language? What gives it the power? Then Robert's going to take over uh, introducing the package ecosystem. So this is extremely powerful. And I mean, the thing that got me into the language was someone told me I could use any Python library in it, which is wonderful. But he's going to use uh, Julia-specific libraries and give you some worked examples from a data science perspective so hopefully that will be of interest to the majority of people in the room. And then the last part is what I'm calling speed and accuracy, and that's me again. So you can call C code natively. You can call Fortran code natively. Um, 
I've used OpenCL in my work, and so I'm going to show how to do that. We can look at things like timing and benchmarking your code and profiling it. I have code here for debugging, but with the new release, the, the debugger is not working yet, so joy. But the code is there, and we can talk our way through it briefly if we have time. The idea is roughly uh, 20 minutes of actual talking per section and up to 10 minutes of questions, and that brings us right up to the, the full hour and 30 minutes. Uh, it's free, though, in the sense that if people are getting really bored with the easy stuff, we can move faster. I've filled the notebooks here because ultimately, to, to co cater to this group of people, it's hard to judge what you need to know. In fact, it's impossible because you're all on different levels. And so there's a lot in here, and I'll just run through the code. I'll talk over it. You can play with it after. There's also stuff down the bottom of the notebooks which you can play with afterwards on your own for, for advanced features and so on. Um, and we, we can see how far we get. If we, if we run out of time on the speed uh, stuff, it's, it's not so relevant if that's where we get stuck with the, with the group. But the code is there for you to play with. So just a few quick notes on how to get Julia in the first place on your system. So julialang.org is the website, and they have downloads. They have downloads for Windows, for Mac OS, for Linux, uh, I think also for ARM processors. They, it certainly compiles for it. Um, Linux distributions do have it in the repositories, but it's not always so up to date, so you should check what version you're using if you're getting it from a repo. And then there's two kind of online solutions. Julia Box, which one or two of the people are, are attempting to use, uh, provides uh, cloud hosting of Jupyter-style notebooks using Julia as the back end. And so that's, a, that's hosted now on Google Cloud. And I think for now it's largely free. It's, they were considering a pay model at one stage, and they seem to have stepped back from that. That is set up by the people behind the language. They've also set up uh, a company called Julia Computing, and they have a product called Julia Pro. I don't work for them, I've never used the product, but it's there in order to provide corporate support and to give a way of getting the language into, into corporate environments. Um, so today we're using Julia 0.6, which like I said, only came out a week ago. We're gonna run it in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, yeah, so like I said, you could, one or two of you are gonna try and run it on Julia Box. We're not, we haven't actually tested it there, but it is just a Jupyter Notebook that we're using, so you should be able to copy and paste the stuff over. And I think you can even clone the repository in, but I'm not sure how to do that. Um, you will need some packages. Uh, so in the, if you clone the repository, this is Notebook 00 that I'm looking at right now. And these commands here, if you, if you run them, if you execute them in Julia, will install all of the libraries that we're using, the packages. And if you type using for each of them, it will then compile various backend requirements. So many of them have C and R and so on in the background doing uh, fast processing and so on. A lot of them use Homebrew at the moment. And this will compile all of that. It'll take a while if you haven't done it already. Um, feel free to go ahead and start, but it will take 10 to 15 minutes. Um, yeah, like I said, I'll be using OpenCL. I kept it separate here. OpenCL has its own requirements, which we'll discuss when we come to it. We'll see if, if you're actually able to get it working. But I have the worked examples already in the HTML versions of the notebooks. Right, how do you actually use Julia? So there's a REPL, the read eval print loop. So that's if you just run Julia and you get a command line. And so you can type in a command, and you'll see the output, basically. Uh, the, <laughs> the command line itself is where you run Julia and then a file name. So that's like Python myfile.whatever.py. Um, so this would be the sort of standard way of running a program. You can use Jupyter Notebooks uh, using the iJulia package. And the other thing that they're working on is, is the um, the IDE, the, the, the text editor Atom, and they're using a package with it they call Juno. And this is, this is very nice. I just have it open here. I would say it's not quite usable yet. I mean, it is, but it's not perfect. But the idea is to give you something like MATLAB or to give you something like uh, Mathematica. So you can just type in commands here. Um, 
and it will give you the, uh, the answer there. And you see I created a my test var, and I've got a workspace here with the, with the test variable value. And you can plot down here. It's, it's, it's fine, but I, I don't personally use it. Uh, my typical use at the moment is to open the REPL and then to import the file that I'm working on. So I type the file in Atom, and I save it, and then I just use an import command, which I think we're not covering today, ironically, but that's OK. <laughs> OK, so the language. Um, what is it? It's dynamically typed, um, much like Python. So Python, when you run it, it every, time you, every time it comes to a line, it has to interpret what the type of each of the variables is before it decides what to do with them. Uh, here, you, like, like Python, you don't have to tell it the type of the variable, but it infers it in a different manner. And so it knows it, roughly speaking, at runtime. So it's able to compile the code, and then it runs at C speeds. So you don't actually have to tag that this is an int and this is a float, but you get that level of speed boost of a compiled language because of how it infers that. So that's what I mean by optional types. Optional types, you can tag it yourself as well, and you can tell it, OK, well, I'm only working here with arrays of float 64s, and then it will know to specialize for that. Um, the built-in types in the base language are equivalent to user-defined types. So this is really nice from a performance point of view, that if you write your own type, some kind of abstract type where you ac accumulate a lot of data in it or whatever, there's no performance um, cost to that compared to using the built-in types. Uh, it's just in time compiled using LLVM. That's the, the compiler. Uh, it uses something they call dynamic multiple uh, dispatch, which I will mention briefly, or I will actually use in my section. It's got metaprogramming. Uh, you can call C and Fortran libraries natively. You can compile against them, basically. Um, and like I said, the thing that convinced me was you can call Python libraries via a, a package they call PyCall. And when you run your code, what happens is Julia converts it into an intermediate representation, and then LLVM compiles that for your machine, and that's what actually runs. This gives a, a two-speed, a two-level operation in a sense where the first time you compile it, it can be slower. So when they benchmark, they like to compile it once. And then for the real run, they'll, they'll um, do it a second time and only time the second run. I would say from our point of view as data scientists, that's somewhat cheating because we tend to only run our code once when it actually works. But anyway, that's the design of the language. So I'm going to close that notebook. We go to the the main one for my section. So, where is it? <laughs> yes. OK, so the approach I'm taking here is good. I'm, tr I'm treating it as if I'm coming to the language and I've been told that it's, uh, I've been told what I've told you guys just now. So you know that it's this sort of scripted language, you know that it's, um, good for numerics, and you start playing with it. How can I get this to work? Huh. Okay, let's keep... Let me just zoom out one for a second. Okay. Okay, so I told you it's good at math. Let's just try out some basic math. I'm going to sit down because it's a little easier for me to type. Um, maybe you could keep an eye out for questions. <laughs> um, so I mean, I just, I just did a equals 10, and it, it does an output a equals 10. Great. I try printing it. I can print the value, and it comes out here. Um, I try printing something more advanced, two different print statements. And you've got interpolation here, where you've got the, the dollar a being interpolated as the value. And I've also got this print statement where I separate the different parts, and they both seem to work fine. OK, what about a floating point number? So I've got b is 15.3. And again, that seems to work. What if I add the two and save them to a variable name, simple sum, and we get 25.3? So that seems to work. Like, I, I understand this is 
too simple for most of the people, but you kind of need to see it once too if you've never used the language. What about trying out a basic math function like exponential? So I, I can calculate the exponential of b, b was 15.3, and I save it as this value, simple math function. So I'm getting 4 by 10 to the 6. Um, and I can do a slightly more complicated thing. I can say the result of my calculation is a plus b times that value, and I print it out, and the output of my calculation is that value. And so the first thing I want to point out here is I did an extra calculation after I did 1 plus 1 just at the end. And you see the output in the Julia notebook is actually 2, but the print statement appears up here. So um, basically, there's, there's two things going on here. I've put in this uh, semicolon here, which suppresses output if you're only running one line. But if you're uh, running multiple lines, only the last line actually gets printed to the screen. So if I suppress the 1 plus 1, we now no longer get that out uh, part. We just, get, we just get the stuff that was in the print statement. Um, so it's kind of, how would I put it? It's, it's, it's optional. Um, it's only really relevant on the, the REPL and here in Jupyter Notebooks. If you're running things uh, as a program, all of the output is suppressed unless you do some kind of print statement. So what about trying some more advanced math functions? I can do sine, tan, hyperbolic tangent, and it all works. The show is a, is a, a macro here where it does a very nice thing where it actually prints the, the argument that I said and equals the actual value that it returns. So this is a very handy way, rather than doing print statements for your, all of your your inline debugging. Okay, so um, I left a few cells blank if you want to try out some other mathematical functions. Basically, um, has you have we any good functions that people like? <laughs> okay, so two to the power of ten works. Yeah, good point. So. Um, yeah, you can't. <laughs> Do you want to take this? <laughs> Do you want okay. Okay, so I've just left those free for you to play with, but we can we continue moving. If people want to ask questions, please just raise your hand and we'll we'll keep an eye out. So we want to um assign some variables. Typically, you just use the equal sign to assign a variable. Under the hood, it's typically um passed by reference to functions and it's all uh, variables are holding references to literals in this system. So we've got something here that's a linspace function, just like in MATLAB or in NumPy. And so here we've got um, from 1 to 10 in steps of 1. Uh, this format here is actually new in this version, so it's using a generator now, which it wasn't before. So I can do the type of that variable, and it's using the, something they call a step range len where it holds uh, float 64s in this particular example. What if I look at the type of some of the other variables that I previously created? So I've got some tuples here in the output. We could ignore that for now. But we see that a was 10, and the type of it was an int 64. So I told you that types are inferred here. It's not me that set them at this point. Now, if I said b to 21, I see that b is 21, and I get an int for b. But if I said b back to 15.3, I see that it's now interpreting it as a float. So there is basically 99% um, of what you want to do with types is automatically handled, and it automatically converts it to the appropriate type that you will need. Um, yeah, so we'll see uh, in terms of the 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 pass by reference this will come into play when we want to see whether we want to change the value of a type or of, of a variable or not so we can create a value here c using this notation as well which for me at least speaks of matlab so one in steps of two up to ten um in this case it does not no it it does not include the last number right <laughs> yeah <laughs> well yeah in the output uh, so the type of this variable here is a step range, which is the more common one rather than this uh, step range len, which came out of the lin space. 
um, we're moving more and more to generators in Python for all of these things, so they're they're evaluated later. So that's why it has this kind of strange type. Uh, it's got various field names that you can examine. It's got a start value, a step size, and a stop value. Uh, you can iterate over it basically using these values. And we can access any value using the square bracket notation. So the third element, and we're indexing from one here, not from zero, is five. So this one was going from one to nine in steps of two. And so the third element of that was five. Um, collect, so there's a, there's a help function, which you can use uh, the um, uh, question mark to access. So collect is a function which um, basically goes over a collection or an iterator and gathers all the elements of it. It collects them. And so we're going to collect the entries of that, of that um, generator, and we now get an array. So we get a, a, a one-dimensional array here of int 64s. We get the elements 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. And we can see the type of that is an array. OK, um, what about creating maybe a string? So if I want to make a, a string, I can do um, my string is, and I've got a string now, so I can um, I can print that out. I can um, I can try adding a number to it. What would that do? So. Like I said, we're just playing with the language to see what happens. This one, uh, this one is, is not going to work, unfortunately. So it doesn't know how to do that kind of concatenation. So the, the best way that I know to do it is to just use the string command. And you're creating it out of these elements. So now I've got a string from the string that I created in that variable and a second variable here. And so that's the, that's the easiest way I know for, for doing some concatenation. Um, yeah, so we've got arrays and basic linear algebra. So we can create an array of, of four ones. So notice here that this is, this is a vector. It's a one-dimensional array. It's not, uh, you, you might expect it that it would be four by four, but uh, rather you use the second argument to create four by four. So here we're using rand. We've got a, the, the Matrix A is a, is a matrix of four by four elements. Each one of them is a random number. Um, I can access the first element using A1 if I want. So it's this top, top left corner here. Everything is column major in, in, um, in uh, Julia for anyone who, who's interested. Indexing is not from zero, so that will give a bounds error. Um, you can use the second dimension. So one, two would be row one, column two. So that would be this entry here, 0.275. Uh, end accesses the final element in the array. And unfortunately, uh, there's no minus one access. So that is a very nice feature in Python that unfortunately has not made it across. You can also do various slicing and broadcasting. So I'm using uh, one to end in steps of two here um, on, both, on both dimensions. Um, I can create an empty vector in a sense. I can create memory here using the vector function for floats, and that's fi five elements. These, the values here are irrelevant because I haven't initialized them yet. So ones was initializing them all to one. This is just basically saying, give me some memory. Um, I can do something similar with, uh, with matrices. So I can create a matrix of floats, and it's four times two in its dimensions. Um, I can do another one here, which has no dimensions. So this is an interesting one for when we, when we do the multiple dispatch. So the multiple dispatch works on types. So you need to know the type in advance. So here I'm setting a variable to have a type, but it's got zero memory allocation. So the, while these ones are creating memory that you can immediately access and edit, this one has no memory, as, this has no memory assigned to it. It just has a type. So if I try to access the first element of Z, I get no access. I, the, it's, the set index won't work on that. Uh, if I try accessing the size of the vector, the matrix, and the empty, the, the zero matrix, I get the first one has a, has a dimension five, the second one has four by two, and the third one, again, provokes an error. We have power cables if anyone needs them. 
and the um, yeah, so in, in terms of assigning to z then, you can't say element 5 of z is now given this value, so you, but you can reassign z to, to a new matrix. So here I've got the matrix con containing 1, 2, 3 in a column, and z is now pointing at that. Um, you can have any type of array. So this is like a vector of vectors, and it's got uh, three elements in the in the outer vector, and the inner vectors have different lengths. So we've got a vector of length 3, a vector of length 2, and a vector of length 3. And that's totally OK in the, in the arrays here. And finally, in terms of memory access, we have, um, I've said V, so this is my matrix uh, W here. I've said V equals W. Now if I access element 1 of V, I can, um, change it, so element 1 of W was 1, 2, 3, and now I'm saying 1, 4, 5 of V. So what happens here? I print out W, and it's now got 1, 4, 5. And so this is the, for the people who, are, who have a less object-oriented background, this is, this is the referencing model that's used for the memory. So V is just getting what a shallow copy of the, of the matrix W. It's just getting a pointer to it to its memory space. So you have deep copy, which you might know from, from MATLAB, for instance, which would copy over the entire array. So V and W here both have 1, 4, 5 in the first row. Um, I now do a deep copy of W to V, and I change the first row of V to 1, 2, 3. But when I print W now, it still has 1, 4, 5, because they're now in separate uh, memory spaces. We made an entire copy of uh, W in, and then pointed V at us. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't need to do a collect here, but I'm just doing it for visualization. So I'm creating a range from 1 to 5, and I'm collecting the elements. And I'm basically giving myself an array of the elements from 1, th to, one to 5. Uh, y can create the identity matrix, a five-dimensional identity matrix. So in this case, I don't need a second argument because the identity matrix obviously has to be square here. And a little bit of, again, playing with the notation, the x prime is a transpose times y. So uh, ve um, a vector times, times the identity matrix gives us back the vector. In this case, the vector was already transposed before we did the, the multiplication, so we get a row vector. There's also a function called transpose, so it's up to you whether you use the little, uh, the little caret here or whether you use the, uh, the transpose function. And then I can um, edit a couple of elements of y. So just this is for an example. I've made this one here one and this one here one, as, as, long, as well as the diagonals. So the, the uh, row one, column two, and row, t row, um, row two, column one. And if I multiply that using the dot notation now, so we've got a vector transpose dot times the y, we see this kind of element-wise operation. And so this is just to show how that, how that operates. So we had one, two, three, four, five in our row vector multiplied by this almost identity matrix. And we see now that we get one, two, three, four, five across the columns. And, and down we just get the re repetition. So it's a, it's a broadcast, basically, of the, of the, um, of the, ve of the vector elements. Um, yeah, so you've seen me create some random numbers already. So here I'm just creating uh, five times one array. I can index them. So I'm looking here to create an index for all the elements uh, wh where the value is greater than 0 0.5, and I get a bit array. So this is something that I've done in the past a lot in, in MATLAB, where I need to look at which elements are, are greater than a certain value. So the first two in this example were greater than 0 0.5, and the last three were less than it, less than or equal to. The, the dot is important here because it's element-wise. Um, you can access the elements of k that are greater than that value by just embedding this, but then you only get the two values and you don't know where they were anymore, which mathematically can sometimes be quite difficult. Um, the now long way of doing it would be to create, a, create this sort of um, vector of values wherever the index is true. 
so I've got the values one wherever that, that, that thing was true and zero elsewhere. The bit array you can't really use for math, so you need to do something like this. But there is a filter function which I would encourage you to look up if you actually go down this route because it is more efficient than this. It's numerically considerably more efficient. Um, flow of control, so we've got booleans, true and false. We can do a while loop. Um, so we're just generating a random number and if the random number is less than 0.5, we set G to false and then the next time you come round to the top of the loop, you will exit because it's now false. So we see a bunch of numbers being printed here and at some point, the 50 second time, second time through the loop, we set G to false, we print the value 53 because it goes all the way to the end of the loop and then we exit the while loop. We can also use a break statement instead. So um, this will exit directly at the break line. You don't come round to when G is e would be equal to false again. So this, this line here will never occur in this particular code. So we go down to the end, it's about to break, and then it's done. Um, there's this Python style indexing. So for element in the matrix A, print the element. So I've lost the dimensions of A here, but I'm just looping through them. Uh, we've got here uh, a comprehension, which is kind of nice. So inside these square brackets, so I print the value i for i in 1 to 3. I can create an entire matrix very efficiently here uh, by using this notation. So I, I generate the values over here. I can loop over, over two things at once. I can loop over i and j using a single for statement um, and generate the values here, and then they get assigned, b gets assigned to point towards them. Yeah. Uh, well, because if I, if I leave it in, you also get this uh, output here. So it's because I'm using print inside the loop and the loop runs three times. Yeah, good question. Okay, um, so I can also uh, create inside a for loop. Um, here, in, so the, the important thing to notice here, the comprehension is very nice for creating B. Whereas inside the for loop, I need to already assign some memory for C. So I, in my case, I just create a, a matrix of ones and then I, I do the values. Um, whereas here, I don't need to pre-assign, pre-allocate B. It just gets done as part of the comprehension. Uh, so we can see the values of C here. Um, yeah, there's a super nice example from the Julia Language blog where they've embedded They've had a tuple here being generated inside a comprehension, and they're looping over four different things. And so the thing I want you to notice here is that the last thing gets done first. So it's like nested loops, where the last one in the list here inside the comprehension is the innermost loop, and then you, you, you scale outwards. Um, I can also do a comprehension inside this function call. So I'm looking at the extrema, and the comprehension is to get the sum of all of the tuples for, for each tuple in that, in that uh, list here, uh, which was called change. And so, yeah, the sum, the extrema, the minimum and the maximum are 100, just because that's what the example was. Um, we can also just do the most simple for loop, which I just wanted to demonstrate here. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are a ternary operator, yeah? Uh, so yeah, it would be, but I can't remember off the top of my head what the what the um, what the function is. I mean, you can clearly do the the trick I did with the indexing, where you would just do um, thing square brackets uh, dot equals the actual extremal value. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there, there, there was is definitely a function, but I, I don't use extrema, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, there's else if, which I didn't show you. Uh, there's no do loop, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Oh, okay. So for those who are late, we've written up the GitHub address here. If anyone needs to clone the the notebooks and the HTML files, uh, it's just up on the top right of the whiteboard. Okay, I. I apologize if this is slightly boring, but it's sort of to give the, the, the overview of the language so you're all on the same page. Even if we only do Robert's uh, really nice example after, that, that's already a really good introduction to the language. Um, 
but I mean, a lot of this is basic, but even if you were learning this at home, you would have to go through them one by one just to know these details. So I can create a function. Uh, the function I called foo, it takes an argument bb, and the end here, so everything ends with an end statement. Um, I didn't say in the introduction, I should have, that um, the, the, uh, this is not like indentation oriented in Python. You, you, every code block ends with an end statement, and so actually th after that the indentation doesn't matter. I it's completely irrelevant here. Um, personally, I actually prefer that at this stage, uh, but that's up to you. Uh, right, so this one prints a piece of text and then it prints the argument value. So if I've got a value A, which was 96, I set it somewhere else and then I call foo on A. It's inside that function and it prints the argument value as 96. The type of A was int 64. Now what if I try to write a function that takes floats? So this is the, this is the notation here for saying that BB must be a float. And this is basically how um, how uh, Julia gets so fast, because it now knows that inside of this function, it only operates on floats on that particular uh, variable type. And otherwise, it's generating multiple different versions of the function in order to take a float, in order to take an int, in order to take a string, and so on. So this one will take floats. I've created it. We now have two functions called foo. So. If I look at uh, the, the help system, okay, that's just for the print command. Um, if I look at the help for foo, there's no documentation because I didn't use any doc strings for my functions, but you can see here that there's two functions. There's foo, which takes a variable bb, which is a float, and there's foo, which takes a variable bb, and there's no qualifier at all. So it'll always use the most specific version of the function. And it also says here where the, where the code is defined. If you were in a source file, these would be actual lines. In my case, it's the, it's the entries in my particular Jupyter notebook. So what if I call it on, on A and then I call it on B? So the first call to foo is on the value 96 and it prints it 96 as before. Uh, now I'm calling with a float B. Um, I'm still inside foo, but that was a float because that's what I told it to print here in my definition of the second version of foo. So we're only using that version. We're not using both. We're only using that specific version of the, of the function now. And we print out that piece of text and we print out the other argument, val the new argument value, which is 15.3. We can also send it a string and we get the generic version and the argument value is this is a string. Okay, um, let's see. We want to talk a little bit about whether, whether what you can access and what you can't inside of a function because this is extremely important for modifying variables. So I've got a function bar which takes a, a variable d and it's going to print the value of d upon entering the func uh, function. It then tries to add the value 45 to it and then it, leaves, it prints the value before it leaves the function. So I'm going to print outside of bar the value of a before and after calling this function. So what we get is the value of a is 96 outside of the function. Upon entering it's 96, just before leaving it's 141. So the plus equals works, but it's not maintained. And that's because of how I'm accessing the memory here with d. And I'll show you now in a second how to change that. So uh, if I look at D instead, D was this, this vector. So I can also operate on a vector with this plus equals notation. And here in the vector, I'm adding, uh, what was the value, 45, to every element in the vector. And we see that, that that also works very well, but again, it's not maintained after we leave the function. Um, this is nice, first of all, that we can operate across the vector so simply, um, but they're not persistently modified. Now what if, I don't know, if you scroll back later, you'll see in the for loop that I used earlier, I was able to persistently change uh, elements of a vector. So if I use a for loop here instead, so instead of using the function uh, bar, I'm now using the function bar2. And I define it here where I print the, the, the value before and after doing some operations on it. And the operation is element-wise across D, uh, add 45. So now if I take that vector, 
I can now change all of the elements and they are persistent after I leave the function. So this, this is quite vital to figure out when you're actually changing things and when you're not. The idea originally is that um, it's, you should typically be able to read stuff really easily in a function, but writing to them should always be a little bit harder and it should require a little bit more work, which is sort of a memory safety idea. It's also about, um, about processing speed and so on in this case. So the, the last topic here of this section is multiple dispatch, which I sort of showed you the very first bit. Yep. Um, typically, yes. Yeah, yeah. So th this is um, this is one of the the interesting things about how Julia is written. It's much closer to C under the hood. So typically, uh, loops are actually extremely effective in it. Um, so the only the only thing that's in in a way more effective is when you're using generators and you're not even running through the elements at that point. But no, uh, loops are extremely optimized. So yeah, it's it's actually as fast. Um, we can you can try some timings later in the final notebook. <laughs> um, actually, I have an example of that in the final notebook. So I've created a function bar which takes a value d, which is an array of float 64s. Um, so I already had uh, a function bar up above, and I also had a function bar two. Uh, this one is going to take an array instead of an a just a single float, and it's going to call bar two on that array. So that's just a way of nesting. So we know that bar two is this function here, and it's very good at operating across the across the array elements, and it can change them persistently. So now, when you call bar on on an array, this th it will basically just uh, uh, fork the work off to this to this particular function. I could have written the code here. It was just for playing around that that I didn't. There's a methods function which will show that there's two versions of bar. There's the one taking the array and the one taking any other. Uh, variable. Uh, there's methods of bar2, which is just that it takes any generic uh, variable. And so now if I start calling a bar on a few different values, so this was on the single value a, I'm not going to enter into how to persistently change that. Um, but the a was just a single um, integer in this case. And so it's not persistently changed. It's the original version of bar that gets called on that. If we now send D, which was this vector, we send in this uh, set of 47, 50, 50, 53, 56. Uh, we see that the values get added to it here. And wait a minute, it didn't work. Why did it not change our variables? So this is something I wanted to show you just to show that you have to be a little bit careful with the types. Um, if I look at the type of D here, I have an array of int 64s, whereas I defined bar 2 for, uh, or I define bar rather, for float 64s. So this is a, can be a pain in the ass at times. And so I've, call, I've now got to write a version which, which specializes for ints instead. And so this one will call bar 2 on the ints. And now if I call bar on D, I'm now in the version of bar which handles ints, and I call bar 2 on them, and we see, uh, well, I didn't print it actually. We should see a persistent change. Yes, so the persistent change is here. Uh, we now see that bar has a specialization for ints, a specialization for floats, and a generic version as well, which was the first version I wrote. And D is persistently changed here. So the last thing I wanted to say on this particular worksheet was a um, couple of take-homes for people who are thinking about this from the point of view of other languages. The base index of the array is 1 and not 0. Uh, at this point, there's almost any version of a generator that you're familiar with will work. The kind of the different notations typically all work here. White space doesn't matter much. Uh, indentation doesn't matter at all. The end keyword finishes all kinds of code blocks, whether it's a function, whether it's a loop, um, whether it's a it's a logic statement, and um, less relevant for most people. But there's column-wise memory layout here, which is similar to Fortran. And so if you're doing your loops, you want to loop um, going down the column first rather than across the, across the columns. 
there's two uh, links here which could be quite useful for people coming from other languages. And now I'm going to hand over to Robert, who's got his package section. now? Yeah. I will also sit. Is this already the good? Uh, oh, you need to remove the. You can talk. <laughs> okay, basically, I want to show you a short uh, project, and I will use uh, three different uh, third party packages that are not part of the language. Um, just to show what kind of libraries are available there, uh, what you might be missing if you come from another language. Um, but first, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the package management. So um, there is this uh, package, package, so it's PKG, and you use it to install and, and maintain packages. And the assumption is that when you develop a package, you will use Git, actually, or, or even GitHub. Um, and when you want to publish the package so that others can install it, you should go to this uh, special um, GitHub repository and add a pull request and then they will enter basically your URL into their registry and if you have done so you can everybody can install your package by just saying package.add and then give the name of your of your package um, before you do that you should do package.update um, which will clone this um, registry so to see say uh, and whenever you install a package you will actually also clone the whole git repository I think this is to encourage contribution. So if you fix a bug, actually, you can uh, from the from the REPL, um, you can make uh, uh, a, a pull request on the GitHub repository. Um, if you want to install a p package that is not yet registered, there's also this package.clone where you just give the full URL. And if you want to work on uh, on a separate branch, you can use this package.checkout. So I think if you're familiar with Git, you will also be familiar with the package management in Julia. Um, and then you can do package.status, and this will show you um, all of the installed packages. So first, it will show you the ones that you manually installed with their version, and then um, it will also show those that were installed as a dependency also with their version. Uh, you can also see here, I checked out the master of some a project that I was working on myself. Uh, okay. So um, the goal of the project is to uh, create an index fund uh, uh, specifically for the Doe drone. So it contains, I think, uh, 30 different stocks of different weights. And I want to pick from these a couple, let's say three or four, with some weights that approximate the whole index. Uh, okay, and I have some, some data. Um, I think I should execute also these. Right. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so Dave already showed you that uh, with this question mark uh, you can get uh, help on functions. There's also another kind of REPL magic is the semicolon where you can just run uh, a shell command. Uh, of course we have to, to wait now. Um, but anyway, there is a CSV file that I prepared um, that I think has three columns for the, the date and then the name of the stock and then the, uh, the value of it. Um, and then in the Julia language itself, uh, there is a function called uh, read CSV. And if you load it in, um, it will um, put all the data in a single array. And you will see here it has the type any because um, some are strings and some are actually numbers. Um, and it also it doesn't really make a difference between the header and the data. So this is kind of a low level way of reading in the CSV file. And maybe if you come from Python or from R, you, you are used to working with uh, data frames. And in Julia, there's also a package for data frames. Actually, it's, there's several, but I, I have picked the most uh, popular one. Um, and so if you want to use uh, functions from a package, you can use the uh, using keyword 
and then the name of the package. Mm. Are we done here already? No. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I should restart this thing. It got slow because he tried to update all my packages, <laughs> so. <laughs> Come on and try and run it. Um, you think so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now we can see the CSV file and uh, the result of the read CSV again. Um, okay, here there's no output. If you run this for the first time, it will probably pre compile it. Um, so whenever you run the package for the first time after it was updated, it will do some compilation, um, but then the next time it should be fast. So data frames has a function read table, um, and uh, it will actually return something like a table. It will also print nice here as HTML. Uh, it will know about the header, and it will give you an additional row index. Um, so here I can, uh, I can index it like an array. I can take the first row and all the columns, um, I can also use uh, a column name. For example, there's this column price. Um, so this notation with the colon and then some name, it's called a symbol in Julia, and it's kind of like a string, but different. Uh, and here you would have to use the symbol, uh, and you would get this column uh, out of the data frame. Okay, so um, basically what I want to do is compute the mean price for each stock over the days of the year, so that I can get an idea of how, how much they contribute to the overall index. And so, um, there, maybe you know that there's this group by and aggregate ap approach, where you first uh, group by the values of some columns. Here it would be the symbol. And then you get, uh, for every group, you get a, basically a sub-block of the table. And this one, uh, you can aggregate with a function. So there is this uh, function called buy from the data frame package. And the first argument is the data frame itself. The next argument is the, the column you want to group on. And here you put another function. Uh, here you can see the syntax for anonymous functions in Julia. Uh, you just put some uh, variable name and then the error and then what you want to do with it. And I will create a new data frame that will compute a column called average price using the mean of this D uh, with the price column. Um, and if I look at the first couple of rows from that one, I can see that it, uh, there's no more any date column. There's just the symbols and then the average price. Um, OK. And now I will normalize this um, to get some weights that uh, basically sum to one. Um, so I will just create a new data frame, and I will create uh, two columns. One is just the old column, and the other one uses this kind of formula. I'm sorry that this is not uh, wrapping around. Um, so if you have used uh, Python's data uh, pandas package, uh, this should all look uh, somewhat familiar. OK. Um, we can also look at the data in different ways. For example, we can, we can pivot it uh, in, in a two-way form instead of this uh, flat form. So this is the original structure with the three columns. Um, but we can also use this unstack command, which will take, again, the data frame. And then it will take two columns to be used for the rows and the columns of the two-way um, sheet. And then another column for the actual data inside of the cells. So here, if I run this, um, I will see that I will have the date for the rows, and then, oh, sorry, this one. No, I, I think I scrolled too far. OK, you can see that it has the date for the columns, uh, for the rows, and then the different symbols for the columns, and then show the value for the day in here. And um, there's also a join, like a database join, 
because now um, I want to join these uh, weights um, that I've computed with the original um, with the original data frame and I will join it on some column name here it's a uh, symbol so this is just the original name with some uh, with some additional column and I will now add a column to this data frame again using this kind of formula notation um, where I just use the price and the weight and I will multiply them component wise so if I scroll around uh, here I can see basically the co contribution that some stock makes of to the total uh, Dow Jones at this at this point in time and uh, I can take the sum of all these contributions and then I will get uh, what I call the index so it's just like a single stock that has a value over time which is kind of the total over all the others okay are there some questions about the data frames part so if you if you look into the ecosystem, you will see that there is uh, I think four or five packages that are developed in this area, and they have different benefits in terms of uh, performance. But data frames was there first, and it's the the most popular and the, the best integrated. Um, and the others they are still kind of competing, and I hope that the development will merge again at some point. So. Okay, next um, I want to go into visualization. Um, we will use the plots package, which is actually not a plotting package per se. It's just uh, it provides some syntax and it uses different backends. Um, and you can basically define the plot and then change the backend depending on whether you want to print it or show it uh, interactively with JavaScript and so on. And um, so here I'm using the pyplot uh, package, with, which is actually based on Python's matplotlib. Um, so this is the one that many of you had problems installing. Um, what happens if you install the, plot, the PyPlot uh, Julia package is that it will actually uh, in, uh, generate a Conda environment and install its own Python and Matplotlib. And then there is a Julia package called PyCall where you can easily call Python function. And PyPlot is built on that. Um, and basically you just uh, use the plots library and then you call one function to initialize the backend. Um, so let's first create some, some random data here. Um, it has, uh, it's a 10 by 3 array, so it has three columns. And if you just do plot of x, um, it will consider the three columns to be different uh, series of data and it will uh, plot them uh, next to each other. So we should see three lines. Mm. Not sure why this is taking so much time. Um, okay, so you can see the three lines. We, if we transpose this, then we would have ten columns uh, instead, and then uh, we will see ten lines. So this is a very fundamental concept of this plots package. If you understand this, uh, then you can then you can start working with it. Um, this concept of using the columns for series is also, also applies to parameters. So if you want to change the color or the, the line width or some style, um, you can also do that. Uh, so for example, um, I can uh, give two colors and then it will cycle through them. So the first one will be red, the second green, and then the third one will be red again. There's also this plot with an uh, exclamation mark. Uh, this is a convention in Julia. If some function has side effects, uh, then there's an, uh, an exclamation mark. And here it means that basically you will add something to a previous plot. So first I can build a plot with this first line, and then I can put something on top of it. Here I just take the same data, but I do a plus three, which we already know puts it uh, element-wise, plus three. Um, and it should actually show it in black and with the different alpha values. And these are now together in, in, one, ch in one chart. Yeah? Didn't quite understand the, the exclamation mark. What is the side effect? Oh, so let's say I remove it. Um, then it will first plot the one and then the other. And I will only see the result of the second one. But what I want is that the first one stays there and the second one adds to the same picture, basically. Uh, it's, it's just a function name, so it's really just a convention. Uh, but you will see this in Julia all over. Um, for example, uh, there is the 
the push that will add something to the end of an array, and this one also has an exclamation mark because it will change the array in place. But there's an append, I think, that will generate a new one that doesn't have the exclamation mark. So here it's just a convention, and there's two different versions of plot, and one will create a new one, and the other will reuse the previous. Um, and so what's great about this uh, plots package is um, that it uses uh, macros heavily to enable plotting for your custom data types. So now, right now we just put in raw arrays, but what I want to really do is um, plot data frames. Um, and so there's another package that we will use called statplots, and it uh, contains so-called plot recipes. So it knows what a data frame is and how to extract the arrays from it and give it to the actual plots. Yeah? Um, uh, yes, so um, there's two ways of using a package. One is uh, with the using keyword and it um, will look at all the exported uh, names and put them in the global namespace. So in a package, um, you can explicitly say some functions should be exported and others not. And the exported ones, they will come without namespace into the, into the global one. Um, you can also use the import instead of the using. And then you would have to prefix the name of the package. And then you would have to use that plots dot the, the function name. Um, and then you will also get access to all of them, not just the exported ones. And the import one is using, uh, the Im import uh, one is important if you want to add methods to a function. So Dave has shown a function, I think it was called bar, and then he has added another method with another type, right? Let's say there is a function in, in, in Julia called uh, the plus operator, right? Uh, and you have your own matrix type, you want to add, implement addition for your own matrix type, then you would have to use import base and then do base dot plus uh, and add to the through the method so yeah to answer your question if you use import then you will have namespaces otherwise it will come together in the global namespace um, you can also set um, several parameters for multiple plots using this width environment so here what I do is uh, the first plot it will take the original uh, data frame and it will use two columns, the date and the price, it's kind of for the x and y axis, and it will group them by symbol, so it will show one line per stock and color them gray, and then I will on top of that plot the data frame called index with the date and value and a little bit um, thicker. So here you can see basically the values of all the stocks in the Dow Jones, and then in blue the aggregated one for the for the total index. Um, and what we want to do now is find one that approximates the blue line using a linear combination of the gray ones. Uh, but first, uh, let me show that in, in the plots package, there's not only the plot command, but there's also a bar chart and histograms and all kinds of stuff that basically has the same, uh, the same uh, calling convention. Um, so here um, I can also show you that instead of giving a color for the color argument, I give the name of a column and then it will use the values and map it to, to uh, this kind of heat map. Okay, now we come to the final part um, uh, where we actually do um, the stock picking. Um, I will not go into the model in detail, I think that would be um, not in the scope of this tutorial. Um, but what I want to do is some kind of linear regression where I want to minimize the L1 norm of, the, uh, of this approximation that I do. So W is, is, is my weights and P is the prices and capital I is this index that I showed in blue. Uh, so I want to minimize this difference, um, but I'm only allowed to pick a couple of uh, Ws that are non-zero. And this can be written in a, a mixed integer linear program in this form, which I will not explain now. Um, but there is um, a lot of very nice packages in, in Julia for doing this kind of optimization. Um, so for example, there is the packages jump and convex. They offer modeling languages, basically. And then there's many Julia packages for solver backends. 
um, like this CBC is an open source one that we will use. Um, and then there is this math proc base package that acts as kind of a glue as an intermediate representation. Uh, so if you want, if you're interested in this, you should go to the website of this Julia Opt organization where they explain how these packages uh, play together. For me personally, that was the reason to actually learn Julia. Um, because in other languages, like Python, they have similar packages, but they are not as easy to use or as powerful. Um, okay, so I will prepare um, some arrays that I will use for, for indexing my decision variables, uh, but there's nothing special, it's just for the symbols and for the days. And then I have a function. Um, it will create a so-called model that is part of the jump package. It will choose a solver to use to solve this problem. And then there are these macros to define variables. For example, to the model fund, I will have a variable pick that has uh, one decision per symbol, and it is a binary choice, so it's a zero one, either I take the, the stock or not, and so on. Um, here you can also see the uh, Unicode as uh, variable names. It's nice for mathematicians. Um, and then here you can see um, how I write constraints. So I actually have a loop and I use the constraint and then you just have the mathematical formula using Julia syntax. So I use the, the sum and then it's an equation. And basically the only thing that uh, you should take away is that uh, this one looks very similar to the mathematical notation. So if you go from here and trans translate it into this one, uh, it will be very close and this is basically what this package offers. Um, and then uh, I add more constraints and an objective and I call the solve and here is where all the magic happens because here it will actually translate it into the in uh, intermediate representation of the solver backend, run the solver and extract the result and give it back to me. Um, um, so if I, for example, use the first 100 days of the year for training and I say I want to pick at most three stocks and I will also give a time limit of six seconds because this will take some minutes typically, um, I can find uh, my solution. The solution will be an array of, uh, uh, of weights for different stocks. Um, so you can see most of them are zero. Here are three that are non-zero. Um, I can take, uh, I can combine them with the prices to get uh, my solution fund and I compare it uh, with the index fund using again the plots. Here you can see that up to the day 100 they, they are quite close together and then they start uh, diverging as we would expect because the, we didn't use this data for the training but you can still see that uh, it's, it's similar enough so maybe uh, our, our index fund is, is successful in this respect. Um, for fun, I also um, looked at the, at the errors that we make. Uh, so here I, I can use this absolute value function pointwise on all the uh, vector elements and then I can do two histograms of the errors that we make during the training. You can see they're quite small and then after the training, the, the red ones, you can see the errors are larger. Okay, I think that's for this, the part for this project. Are there some more questions? Yeah, the optimization, is it a parallel function at the end or is it just running on one? Uh, it's just uh, sequential, yeah. And it's also, so it, this is not Julia code that is running, but there is this, uh, it's a C library basically that has a Julia wrapper and this is fed the model and then called and uh, run. It's, uh, it's called for solving the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so we have 15 to 20 minutes left. I'm obviously not going to do everything. Uh, we should also have a few questions at the end. Um, but um, that last question is kind of relevant to what I want to do here. So um, I'm looking at speed. And uh, the thing is, we're using Julia to write the glue that holds everything together. 
thank you. <laughs> and um, <coughs> it's, it's nice from that point of view. But obviously, from speed point of view, there are libraries that have been written in the 70s in Fortran that are still being used today for various numerical optimization problems. You don't go and rewrite those as a package. What you do instead is you write an interface to them. Um, the interface works extremely well because of the way of being able to compile against these various libraries. The other thing is, and I think this is probably what Robert means by the, the syntax, and he, he prefers the syntax for optimization packages in Julia compared to Python. Because of things like the multiple dispatch, because of how the various macros work, it's extremely expressive from a mathematical point of view. And most people I know who are using Julia today are actually quite hardcore mathematicians. They're, they're the biggest group of, okay, there's a, so, uh, sampling bias here, but they're <laughs> strong <laughs> sampling bias, but they're the biggest group I know who are currently using it. The finance industry are kind of coming in and we'll see now with the data science. Um, so the, the first thing I wanted to mention is that you can call a C function natively. So there's a, a function call called C call. And if I do it here with my show macro, I call uh, the clock function three times. Um, the syntax I'm only going to summarize, but basically what it is is clock is a, is a function to give you like ticks on the computer, and it returns an integer, and it takes zero uh, zero parameters. So you can call it. I called it three times in a row here, and you see that these numbers are incrementing, and it's, it's, there's more than one tick between the calls. You can see. Um, I can also call the rand function, and I get three random numbers. Um, I can call the printf function, and it can print my text here, blah. Um, I can even do a slightly more advanced call here and do uh, the whole um, interpolation of the, of the printf function. So the function I'm calling here is printf. Uh, it returns an int64. Uh, that's, I had to look that up to see what it re actually returns, but it's the error code, basically. Um, there's something here that, that's defined in, in, um, in Julia called a C string, which is the first argument to it, and the second argument is an int64 in my particular case. So I send it this, this whole syntax here, which anyone from, from a C background would rec recognize. So it's a string inside the inverted commas, Notice that in Julia, it's the double quotes that are used for, for strings. Um, my text, and then there's this percent %d, which then it gets replaced in, within printf. It, it slots in the 999 in, in, in place of this operator. So that works. The more normal way to do these C calls is to actually wrap them inside some kind of function here. So this is an example I took from the Julia manual, uh, where they're calling get env, so get the environment. And here they've specified what library it's, it's in. And they're just doing a little bit of error handling in case uh, something comes back that's, that's a bit unexpected. So if I get, the, get env on my system, I've got the path, and you can see Julia's in my path. Um, if I call get env on some parameter which doesn't exist, it handles it very well via that particular um, error function here, that, that uh, opt out, basically. Um, okay. So I have an example using, yo, oh, sir. Um, how would you call a C function that array computation? Because of the different methods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to call a Fortran function because this is basically Fortran mm -hmm. with the index one and. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing I should say, I wrote it in the text, is for the Fortran function, there's one difficulty, which is Fortran compilers either compile to uppercase function names or lower, depending on your compiler, and you have to figure out which one yours does. Uh, so that's a little problem there. I, I can't remember how to, I, I think it handles it in the interpretation in Julia here, but I, I actually don't remember for the, for the, the arrays. Um, so yeah, no answer basically. <laughs> so, thanks for the question. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good to ask. <laughs> um, so I mean, I have, a, I have an example using OpenCL because this is pretty hardcore parallelization. Um, I think I would actually leave it to after and people can play it on their, with it on their own computers and they can ask me about it if they want. 
Um, basically, OpenCL is a C derivative which can run parallel computations. And you can target it to a GPU or to a CPU is the idea. And that's why I use it extensively in my work. And the, the huge benefit is that you can write the code on a computer here which only, ha well, this, this computer actually has a GPU as well, but you can write it on a, on a computer that only has a CPU. And then you can recompile it later on a computer where you have a GPU. And it just works straight away, and it's incredibly fast. Um, basically, the example I used here is using the OpenCL package. And I wrote some functions myself, which do some of the maintenance and so on. Um, they, so just if you don't have OpenCL on your system, the HTML version of the notebook online has all of this printed out already, so you can follow it in full. You don't need to install OpenCL. And depending on your computer, it can be difficult. OpenCL is somewhat of a pain in the ass in terms of programming. That's why I have so many of my own wrapper functions here. Um, this, the Julia hook into it is so nice specifically because you can compile against these C things so easily. But OpenCL doesn't provide so much yourself, it, itself. And so you tend, when I wrote my own code in C, I had to write these wrapper functions in C. And now I, I write them in Julia just to, to sort of automate a lot of the setup and that. The example I have here is one I did on a uh, workshop in, in March with some students. And basically, um, it's a physics problem where you take a single drop and you watch it diffuse over time. The, the timings in it should be able to run on any of your computers. Um, that's why it won't diffuse so far in this particular example. But you can run it for much longer. Um, the huge, huge benefit here is that you can use extremely large arrays. So I'm using a 5,000 by 5,000 array. And I, in the example, I'm doing 1,000 time steps. And um, so if I look at the text that I've written, so on my GPU, that takes 35 seconds to, on, the, on the laptop without it plugged in. Uh, running on the CPU to do that particular calculation is more than five minutes, and that's in parallel on the CPU. Um, so I've done a version where I use an, uh, an array that's 25 times smaller, and that takes 15 seconds on the CPU and only two seconds on the GPU. Um, the other thing is that the students also wrote a naive version of the code, which is uh, a CPU-only version where it's doing more or less the same calculations. I mean, it's getting the same end result and um, just doing it on the CPU. So for the, for the small array, that's 26 seconds on my machine compared with two seconds for, for OpenCL on the GPU and 15 seconds for OpenCL on the CPU. Um, but I just, I mean, I want to be honest here. This is an example where I made a very big array. Uh, for a smaller problem, you do incur overheads when you're shipping uh, problems off to the GPU and back. You've got, you've, got, you've got to wait, basically. You send a message to the GPU, you have to wait. There's a pipeline. Whereas on the CPU, you're already operating in cache and so on. So you, you are operating faster as long as you don't have a big problem. Um, so I also plotted and so on. So the, the last thing I wanted to talk about was kind of issues like timing and so on. Um, so I've written a function here which does, does a loop, and I can time the loop using the time macro. And so this one took 0 0.3 se 0 0.03 seconds. I can do a larger loop, and it takes, uh, I think it's three or four seconds, three seconds. Now, I just have these examples here because I'm doing it, the loop in different ways. And basically, you'll see the different timings. So for the first loop, I allocate an array of zeros. And then I, I, give, I fill out each entry of the array. In the second loop, and that took three seconds. In the second loop, I just created the, the memory space. I didn't actually set the values to zero. And then I set the, I, then I, set the actual values that I'm looking for using the same method. And that one took actually fractionally longer this time around, but they're more or less the same. They're both three seconds, roughly. Um, the final one was using that comprehension. Um, so I, I left in the creating the memory space here to show that this is just the, the difference for the loop. Um, but obviously, you don't even need to allocate the memory anymore in this example. And so when I time this one, 
I get a time of 0.8 seconds, which is considerably faster, but I use, I think, roughly twice as much memory in, in, in doing this. So, so there is a trade-off there. Um, there's a really, really nice package called Benchmark Tools, which can do this on a much wider scale, and you can program in benchmarks into your code, which are then run automatically um, in, in, a, in a highly, highly comprehensive manner. The only thing I'm showing here is running the kind of equivalent of my timing there, again, using the benchmark macro. But it's able to do much, much more complicated things than this. So instead of running time just once on the loop, it now runs the loop multiple times. And it basically, it does it in an intelligent manner. So it, it times how long it takes. And based on variance and so on, it, it'll, it'll decide how many times to run the loop to, create, to, to calculate a mean and so on. So in the, in the, in the simple loop, uh, the memory estimate used is, is like 760 meg. They, uh, it's 2.2 seconds roughly for most of the runs, and it did three runs. The second one should come in pretty similar. Uh, yep, so it's again 760 meg, and it's, it's about uh, two point something seconds. And the final one, which was the really fast one when I ran time, so now we just get to see compared to three seconds and compared to the memory here, we get to see how long it takes. So it's 1.4 gigabytes rather than 760 meg. That's per run, that's not, like, that's not uh, over, the, over the total. But it's only taking 700 milliseconds. And it ran this uh, seven times rather than three because it found some kind of variance and it, wanted, it, it needed to check. Um, yeah, you can do this on, on other functions. Uh, I don't know that it's necessary. And there's also a profiler built into the system. So I can profile what my loops do. So here I initialize the profiler. I, I run the loop, but I've decided here to clear the profile again. And now I run it again, but this time with the profiler macro on. And so that line is running right now on those two, two loops. And then... I'm going to use this profile view to view the output of that. <laughs> and I should be able to get a nice uh, picture. So, OK, uh, it's not going to be the best on this screen. There's, <laughs> there's a lot more over the other side, which I can see when I get the screen right. But I won't play with it now. Um, I have to keep my hands off it. Uh, OK, so there is a profiler. There is a debugger. But as I said at the start of the talk, uh, they just the guy who's writing it hasn't updated it in, in time for today. The new version of, of Julio only came out last week. But it runs pretty much like any debugger. You can set breakpoints. Um, you can set breakpoints at a line in the code, or on entry to a function, or on specific conditions. Um, and yeah, basically, hopefully, you can, you can play with that if, if you actually have a need for that in your programming. I think we're going to stop there. Are there any questions before we wrap up? I mean, particularly, you, you guys are coming here because you're somewhat curious. We've tried to give you the full overview, which is crazy. But it, at the end of the day, when you don't know the language, you sort of need to know the basics. And then it, on the other hand, we also want to show you some advanced topics because it's more interesting for us. Um, what, is it, what is it you need to know? So yeah. Do you have the microphone? Yeah. yeah. In your diffusion example, uh, do you have comparable times in Python, maybe? Or s no. Um, uh, maybe any rough estimate, if you have any I mean, what would, you, what would you write it in? You mean, you, you mean NumPy, really, rather than Python, I guess. Get an idea of how fast this is. I mean, it's, it, the, the problem is it's very hard to compare because, between languages because it's, it's usually an unfair comparison. You, you know, I'll use some trick. Some, the guy who writes for the other language will eventually figure out a better trick on his language and so on. Um, if you've written it super efficiently and all the rest in NumPy, it should be roughly on the order of the, the, the naive implementation here because that is C speed on a single, single thread. Um, once you go to the OpenCL stuff, you're parallel even on the CPU. So I, I would expect NumPy to be, if you really write it well, it should be comparable to, um, to Julia for the core processing. 
on top of that, you do have the overhead of, of Python in general. So whatever else you're doing, everything is scripted and so on. So num NumPy is, is very fast, but Python is not. Was there one more back? I'm surprised nobody asked, is Julia ready for use? But that's OK. I guess you're all convinced. Um, actually, tackling on, on that idea, so what would you say is the, the biggest limitation, so the thing you like the, less, the least right now? Change. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's getting there, but it's not stable enough. And I get a bit annoyed with the, the core developers. They're a tight group sitting together at MIT. They're doing all the right things, but when you can't see the roadmap and you know that they're going to change some of the core features in the future, you don't know when and you don't know how, that's, that's painful. It's painful to upgrade the software and then see some warning deprecation on your code. Um, so that's, that's a humongous pain in the ass. Uh, it would be nice if they were like Microsoft and they would release the definition of .NET three years before the actual language appeared. But they are only like six to eight people. And I would say for in terms of speed and efficiency and everything else, they are making the right decisions. But, you know, I can't wait for version one, basically. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I, I would see it as a huge competitor to MATLAB in the long run um, and, and to all kind of uh, data science tools in general. But uh, the thing that's going to hold most of you back is the fear that the language is not stable and that something is going to change. And especially, you know, you've got your workflow. The changes are getting smaller and smaller, but you'd rather not come along when your boss asks you to do something and realize that your upgrade killed something that you were already using for, for the last year or so. So I think we got to stop there and hand over to the next people. So actually, it's a break time, right? So yeah, enjoy the break. <laughs>